Good evening. I'm Francesca Zambello, Artistic and General Director of the Glimmer Glass Festival. These are my wonderful colleagues. This is Taswell Thompson, librettist and director of Blue. <laughs> and composer Janine Tazori. <laughs> All right. So we have a great program tonight for you. We're going to talk a lot about the piece. Uh, we're going to hear some wonderful excerpts from it. Uh, and I hope you have a great time, because we're very excited about this. So first of all, just a couple of things to uh, sort of clear up in the business department. First of all, we are extremely grateful to our hosts here uh, and sponsors and producers and presenters, works in process. We're also very grateful at the Glimmerglass Festival to those who have helped us financially to develop this work and the commission, specifically the Mellon Foundation, Opera America, uh, trustee Gene Stark, and trustee in Washington, D.C., Jacqueline Badger Mars. We are very grateful to all of them for helping us do a new work. And I know this audience, you are used to hearing and learning about new works, but they are a, you know, obviously a big expense for a company, but also a, a lengthy process. And so you are in on it just a couple of months before the premiere is about to happen. So, uh, and I hope all of you, I'll push Glimmer Glass later in my talk. I won't go too deep into it right now, um, because if you've never been there, I need to encourage you, urge you to please come up and see us. It is a short hop, much shorter than standing in line at LaGuardia and fighting TSA to go anywhere else. You can just get in your car from here, the Upper East Side, and be there in three hours. Um, and we have a great season. I'll talk about the rest of it later. So let's get on to what we're here for tonight. Uh, so, first of all, blue. What is blue? Why blue? What are we doing here? Taz, I want to start with you a little bit. Just if you would tell us a little bit about blue and what it's about and what it's in a way in response to. Blue is a contemporary opera and it's set um, not too far from where we all are here tonight. It's set in Harlem and it, um, it's about uh, a black family who lives in Harlem, and they're awaiting the arrival of their um, firstborn, their newly married, and um, they're going to have a son. They found out they're gonna, it's going to be a boy. And as, uh, should I talk about Act One now? Or just you go? should talk about Act One now, okay. yeah. Can everybody so, hear okay? Are we happy with the volume? Yeah. You can hear me. Okay, good. So as the opera opens, in Harlem, we have uh, a young mother whose girlfriends have come back to Harlem because she's nervous, it's her first child, and uh, three girlfriends all grew up in Harlem, but now they're scattered around the, uh, across the country in their own professions and lives. And they come back to help her, to ease her nervousness as she is about to become a mother for the first time, but she's mostly nervous because she's going to be giving birth to a black boy. And the inspiration for my writing this particular libretto comes from Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me, in which he wrote a letter to his 14-year-old son about what it means to be a black boy or a black man growing up and navigating it across America. And he based his book, um, Letters to His Son, on James Baldwin's um, the Fire Next Time, in which James Baldwin wrote to his 14-year-old nephew about the same um, idea, the same theme. So the girlfriends come to Harlem. They prepare her and you know, tell her, just going to have a baby. And then they also, when they realize it's going to be a boy, they become very concerned. Um, the boy, uh, baby boy, is born in the hospital scene, which you'll... Uh, see tonight. You'll hear an excerpt from that tonight. And um, the father goes out in the following scene after the hospital scene, and he tells his um, buddies about the birth of a boy. Now, the father is a black police officer, and his friends are also police officers. I knew nothing about police officers except for my encounters with Police officers. And we're going to talk about that after right. we hear some music. So, <laughs> that was thank you for that. Okay. Nice. Right. okay. <laughs> and so, but the, the men have a completely different reaction from the women. 
they're thrilled that it's a boy, and they want to know how he could have a boy on the first try when they've been trying to have boys. Um, and so uh, after the hospital scene, we finally get to meet this boy who is now a teenager. And uh, there's a scene between the father and the son, which we'll talk set up about Great. that later. So we're, Janine, we're going to hear two excerpts first off. Well, uh, I mean, I have nothing left. Taswell t hogged it all and said everything. So there's okay. nothing left to say. All right, well, <laughs> actually, why don't you do, we're going to first hear an aria from the mother. Yes. You want to tell us about Go Figure? Um, so Go Figure um, is the... It's in the first scene, when we meet the women, I just have to say a quick shout out to the women, the young women of a broader way who are here. Um, I, um, you, uh, just to say that this group of young women who I've worked with for, for many years inspired this opera deeply and the people, Toya Darren and Ayadeli, inspired for the, from this community. Um, uh, so this first aria is called Go Figure, and you know, these women, we often get a depiction, I think, of, uh, look, at uh, what am I? I'm, I'm, I'm an Italian-American woman, but um, I, I, what I've really not seen and not experienced is African-American family life when it's okay, when there's prosperity, when there's abundance, and um, this these women are upper middle class, they're professional women. I'd like to think that she has a PhD. I, because I don't have one, I gave her one. I, I think she's from University of Michigan, go blue. I think that, um, uh, that was for you, Toya. I think that she always thought that she was going to be with a professional man in that, uh, you know, she never thought she was gonna be with a cop. She never thought she would be with an officer of, a law, of the law. So when she tells her girlfriends, and you can imagine this, that you, you, you think that you're gonna be with someone else, and she tells them that she's in love with a police officer, and they're in, in, incredulous, and they're afraid, and she describes her love in this first aria. We will go right from there into the hospital scene, and I don't know if anybody has ever had a baby or been with someone who's had a, a baby, but the first few days, it's, it's just like someone puts a baby in your hand and there are no batteries included and there's no list, there's no nothing, you just go and you're exhausted. And especially if, like me, you've never even held a baby before. I hadn't even babysat until I had a baby and I was babysitting 24 seven. So we are going from the first aria called Go Figure to the hospital scene where the mother has just given birth and the father has handed the baby for the first time and the nurse enters also in, into the second scene. Great, so we'll be welcoming Brianna, Kenneth, and Ariana. First up, Brianna, accompanied by Kevin Miller. Thank you. That means come on out, guys. Don't make mistakes. Don't make mistakes.
Kellogg, who is doing the role of the father, and then Ariana Douglas will be here in a moment, and she is the nurse in the hospital. Oh, 
Now we're going to go a little forward in the piece to the final scene of Act One. Uh, and Taz, if you would just set the scene first, we are going to hear the whole scene, but just. It's now 16 years later after that hospital scene. And the, the boy has, is a very good student, an art student, and loves poetry. And his room is crammed with all kinds of um, artworks, collages, and paintings, and he loves going to the museums. But he's also a young political activist, and he's always in trouble. If there isn't a demonstration or a march, that hasn't happened without him. And he's um, mostly embarrassed that his father is a black police officer, because um, the son, who has read James Baldwin's book, um, the fire next time, and has had the talk, um, which is um, something that happens in a black family uh, where the father or mother, but usually the father, talks to a young boy and um, prepares them how to go out into the world um, because there's a lot of, in James Baldwin's book and also through most black families where a black boy is considered in this country to be a walking target. And so the boy, you know, discovers early on that his 
father is a black police officer and he doesn't want to bring his friends home and he's um, appalled that his father wears a blue uniform, that's where the title comes from, blue. Having interviewed a couple of uh, police officers, they refer to themselves as black in blue. So the scene that you're going to see now happens in the boy's uh, bedroom. He's gotten himself into trouble again uh, through a demonstration and something that he did to a police officer. And the father pursues him into the room and the scene that you'll see explains everything. Okay, great. So we are, I think, I think anybody who has a teenage child or who's been a teenager, this also speaks to, I think, families today. That was another, to me, a big inspiration in this scene. So I want to welcome Aaron Crouch and Kenneth is coming back and we'll, this is the final scene of act one. Just you happen. just walk into my room, just like that, you don't knock. I open before every door in this house. Ha <laughs> ha house, the railroad back with me down the long, dark corridor. Before in that is home. <laughs> home, that's a laugh. When has it ever been a home for me? To ride with on penitentiary. I got my own body to learn. In this house, and I'll be damned if I'm gonna ask you for permission to come and go through these doors. You 
gotta stop this crazy shit you're doing. Like tonight, picked up for jumping turnstiles. So petty and so stupid. No, New York is the richest city in the world. Millionaire Central. Mass transit should be just that. Transit for the masses. For free. For people get up and go to work. Statue of Liberty, the con, the con, the Constitution. Ding dong, the Liberty Bell. American flag, American ass. Apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie. For the black man, all of it. A cruel joke. Stop trying to set the world on fire. Set the world on fire, trying to put out the fire. I'm not gonna lose you, lose you, lose you to some bullshit antics on the street. Stop trying to set at work and your rage and your generation The world's gonna 
change on its own. Don't need you to help it. It's not your problem. What am I supposed to do? Stay alive. That's what you're supposed to do. Look at you. Dress like somebody's damn gypsy. Get a haircut, pull up your pants. Remove the jewelry, take off the hoodie. Take off the hoodie, the hoodie, the hoodie, the hoodie, the hoodie, the hoodie. What 
Great. We're going to chat a bit about the whole piece, and then we will hear uh, an excerpt from the end of the opera before we leave tonight. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, that scene definitely gets me. I think any parent definitely it it hits you no matter what. Um, for me, this piece, uh, when we commissioned it at Glimmerglass, was something that came from really, uh, I think, our collective frustration, all of us at Glimmerglass, and watching so many. Uh, incredibly unjust actions happening in our country. And we have tried at our company to speak about many social issues alongside Labo M and Carmen. I mean, <laughs> it's not like 
the, the ABCs are going away. We believe in them, but we also believe in trying to find ways to use the incredible power of music and theater together to speak to issues, uh, a wide range of issues, but certainly this important issue today. And so in conversations with Janine and Taz, uh, I think two years ago probably, um, I wanted us to commission a work and I, I didn't want it to be like based on something. It could be inspired by things which you've talked about. But I said, could we please have an original text? Uh, which is, is very hard in operas. Many operas, as you know, have you know, very specific sources. And so it was through a lot of conversations and a lot of serendipitous events of meeting different people like Frank Riley that we came to uh, this story. And I'd love for you guys to talk a bit about the sources and the inspirations and how you ended up with this story. Um, well, you, you came to me at first and I've actually not, I didn't know Taswell. Taswell and I met by writing together. It's how all good arranged marriages work, I think. <laughs> I saw Taswell's a fantastic director as well as writer and playwright. And he directed Appomattox at WNO and I saw that and I said to Cheska, well, who is this Taswell Thompson? <laughs> and, um, and then we were introduced uh, to, to write this piece. And the, the first impulse, I think, was to write it about a musician. And I really didn't want to do that, mostly because I knew and had seen the stories of African-American male musicians. I had not seen an opera about a, a black officer of the law. And I wanted to understand both sides of not only being, you know, it's, it's complicated. Any, any issue, when you really get deep in and dive in, is complicated. And, and it's not just black and white, literally, and yet it is. And, and so part of the problem and part of the solution is when you're in the enforcement and you're not in the community. And that's so you're part of the problem and you're part of the solution. The church itself, which is we had many conversations about the church being part of the solution and part of the problem. I was raised as a Roman Catholic and we were from a young age, I, I was terrified, terrified. I thought it was like a Jonathan Edwards angry God. And that, you know, you just have to wait. You have to wait. That was the idea of religion. That's how I perceived it. And it really informed my, my life in a, in, a, in a great way. And I, I think that the, the church that I saw was part of the solution, part of the, the problem. And I come from a family that's deeply faith-based. And, and so I think when it's prismatic that you look at something and it's from this angle it looks like this and this angle it looks like this. So we wanted to tell the story of a family. And in a way, it's also a Greek story in that the fates for young black men are somewhat determined. They're somewhat predetermined, like, like the fates the cutting the cutting the thread, spinning the thread, and um, and what are the chances? And yet these characters should be innocent of the coming moment. And I was we've been really playing with that, and the girlfriends and the police, the policemen who are around them. So I was really interested in in that the first act is filled with possibility and joy, and simply raising a teenager, you know, simply raising a teenager who hates you. It's it's the idea of when they're two and then they jump to 16 and they've learned no. And, and they say no from the ages of two to 16 and then there's this beautiful spot when they're 10 where everything's going really well. <laughs> and we just wanted to tell that story. And, and then I think in act two, because the, the action of violence is off stage, we didn't want to show it. We wanted to see what was not possible any longer because the fate had intervened. And that really interested me, especially in my friendship with Taswell and hearing his stories um, from all sides, not, not you know, the complication of making a great dramatic work or attempting what I hope we've made is something that isn't so easily answering, that police are bad. It's not, that's not the truth. The truth is far more complicated than that. Taz, talk a bit about, you, you interviewed a lot of police officers. Uh, could you talk a bit about that? Well, you mentioned Frank Riley. Frank Riley, police officer from uh, now lives in Washington, D.C. He, uh, he just retired. He's been with the police force for a very, very long time, and he wanted to be a police officer. Um, originally, he wanted to be on the stage, but he also fell in love and married this wonderful um, woman who he's still with, and he 
started a family and he's you know found out that police officers have great insurance and especially a great dental plan <laughs> and that did it for him he became a police officer and roaming around Washington DC he told me about his experiences that um, he was his beat was in the predominantly black neighborhoods of Washington and um, and he, he is black. And he is black, yes, I should say that. And he had a rough time. And it took him a long, long time, years, before the community began to see he was not just the man in blue, that he was one of them. And, and so I heard about all of the different stories that he encountered, being a black police officer. Um, his children uh, grew up, uh, while they were growing up, adored him was proud that he was this wonderful police officer who worked in the community, did things with children after school. And um, Frank uh, recently has been able to live his dream. He was in an opera that <laughs> Jessica directed, and then he was in a play that I directed. <laughs> and um, then I also met a police officer in Harlem who, um, whose son despised the father, who's a, a black police officer, because of the scene that you just saw, was embarrassed that he, you know, his friends found out that his father was a police officer, uh, because the, you know, all the boys and some girls have always had bad experiences with, with police officers, uh, black and white. And the authority figure was now in the house with this young man, and um, uh, um, he, he, uh, this police officer got married at a very early age, um, and he, uh, all he knew was be, uh, being a police officer. So he told me about his experiences and his relationship with his children. His little girl adored him, would run to the door and ju literally jump into his arms, and, um, and the, the son would go into his room and close the door, lock the door and had scenes like this. Um, so that was part of the inspiration too. I grew up a Roman Catholic, um, and uh, in, I was seven years old. In April, I was uh, baptized. In uh, May, I made my first communion, and in June, I made my confirmation. <laughs> One, two, three. And then I thought in July and August that I would die and become a saint. It was, it was, I would skip priesthood, which the nuns were pushing me toward, and that I would just automatically, I don't know, ascend, fall, ascend to heaven. <laughs> I was steeped in Catholicism and the catechism, and the Baltimore catechism, I should say. And I was inspired by the nuns who saw at a very early age that I was a writer. And um, uh, so, you know, the nuns, identified in me. I grew up in a convent for seven years. And um, I loved writing, and I, I loved also being on the stage. And so I was, I was spoiled by these wonderful nuns who took care of me. And I never knew anything about the turmoil that was going on outside of the convent. This was in the 60s. And so when I was, as the nuns said um, at my graduation, Mr. Thompson, I never knew I had a first name for seven years. It was always Mr. Thompson. And when I was, they said, now you are sprung from St. Dominic's penitentiary and you'll go out into the world. Not a convent, but a penitentiary. They had a great sense of humor, many of them. They knew. And they prepared me for the talk. They gave me the talk. Um, they didn't give the talk to any of the white kids, but they knew what was going, I was going to meet going out into the world, and they were absolutely right. And it was right at the height of uh, all civil rights demonstrations and uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, what side you were gonna be on, did you call yourself black, were you colored, were you Negro? All of those things were in the air. And so when Cheska and Janine approached me to, to uh, write the book of this opera, I had many sources from life, from being a, uh, a teenager who, not like this teenager, but being a teenager who was thrown into a, the political world of America and, and my fear of police officers. And um, 
and wanting to really have a family. I didn't have the family that's, that I wrote about in this opera, and I was able to write about it because it was something that I yearned for. Um, I was separated from my mother and father and I, um, because of the problems they had. And um, so I spent almost eight years as a child growing up in a convent. And uh, so when, the, when I was approached to write this opera, I knew from everything that was going on at the time that Janine and Cheska approached me and, Ch and Cheska wanted something that had to do with, with what was going on in the world. She never said, write about this. She said, I want it to be something that is happening in, in our country today and how we're all affected by it, black or white. And, um, sh and she said, I just read this book between the world and me, and I had also read it, so we talked about that. And I'm a, a, a great, great um, collector of the works of James Baldwin, so everything started to fall into pieces for me. I, I knew where I wanted to go with it. And we can be grateful to the nuns that they were like sister act and gave you a sense of humor. <laughs> um, so that's an amazing thing in this opera, that act one is full of a lot of humor, uh, and Janine, I don't know, but you write beautiful music and you also can write funny music. Um, you can. Opera has I mean, all the jokes, the girl just in, two octaves the girl off. In, That's what the girl I said. Girl in 14G is one of the funniest songs I know. And so, Janine, tell me a little bit about, you know, how you wove humor through, through these characters. Um, well, I come from, you know, theater. Uh, opera is a great love. My, my grandfather was... Um, uh, an, uh, a composer in Italy and came here and died too young to see uh, any kind of career and my mom was raised in a, an orphanage. Basically, Taswell and I are just joined at the hip. We have to say that. <laughs> Secret marriage. Um, so I really feel like, you know, I, I'm a, lo a lot of the collaborators I've been really lucky enough to work with, like George C. Wolfe, who is one of my dearest friends, and he always says, if you, wanna, if you want to um, invite people in for the pain, you have to have a party. So the party pain ratio, the, the stronger the light, the darker the shadows. And, and I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, these are real people. These are people who live and, and you know, have scrambled eggs. And, and, you know, they're not, they're not, their training is one of the things that I was saying to Aaron, who is such a beautiful young singer, is the idea that to me, the epic nature of opera is the tessitura just simply describes the nature of the greatest ups and the greatest downs. And I've never been more in love or more angry than when I became a parent. I had no idea. I was like, well, there's the basement and there's the attic. You know, it's just, you get, you get absolutely stretched when you love. And that to me is what's operatic about it. However, you have to tell a really good joke. And, and I really think that you know, the invitation into the party is very, very important because this family is funny and the girlfriends and the policemen are funny and they have great times until they don't. Until they don't. And that to me is what life really is. It's ridiculous and tragic and, and, and all of these things. And I wanted to invite um, people who, I, I am very interested in my theater work of, telling stories from people who are, aren't usually at the center of the stage. And that includes me. I've, I've not really seen, um, you know, in the, the spirit. That's why I think I started writing the things that I really wanted to see. So it's been my great honor to work with Towswell and hear our, our stories, my stories of growing up with a lot of violence, Towswell's political feel, feelings about the politics of the world, which had a violent nature rushing out at him, and I think that's where we really joined, but also I think the ability to, to um, really, the capacity for, any, for the joy in any piece to me is so important. Otherwise, you just can't take it. You just want to go to the bar and get a gimlet and call it a day. And you, just, right. you can't take it. So and that sounds like a segue to the second act. Always with a gimlet, <laughs> yes. Um, let's talk a little bit. We're gonna, we are gonna hear an excerpt from the, the end of the opera, but Let's talk, uh, Janine, if you would, just setting up, uh, oh, how lovely, that's our theater there. Um, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I cried right Actually, there. you've been seeing, obviously, images from the designers, uh, Jessica John, costume designer, and Donald Eastman, set designer, lighting design, will be by Robert Weirzel, and, and obviously, this is a room of New Yorkers, so you recognize the architecture. Um, 
Tell us a little bit about the second act and then what we're going to hear. So during the intermission, you find out that this um, young man, uh, well, you find out in the first scene of act two, when the um, father goes to see a reverend, that you found out that this young man has been shot. And you never see it. You only hear about it. And, and he challenges. It's, it's interesting. We were both interested in the idea of the father and the son, like the father with a capital F and the son and the trinity, and the idea that the father becomes a son when he goes to the reverend and, and, and challenges. Of course, he's, he's in mourning and his faith is being challenged and he's so angry and he hands over his badge and he puts down the gun and says he wants to go and seek revenge for to take this other, the officer who shot his son and they, the, the, pre, the reverend convinces him to not do that. They go into the funeral, the congregation sings, um, the girlfriends are preparing, and it reminded me in, in a way of the Trojan women with the fates, that they prepare the mother who is catatonic with grief, trying to simply get her dressed. They put on her lipstick, they put on her hat at last and her coat and walk her to the funeral, inside the funeral. But the epilogue that we, it was really important to us to not end it with church. The epilogue is a flashback, so you go back to that scene that you had at the end of Act One, but you see the mother's side. The mother owns a restaurant, and she has tons of takeout from, soul, from the, her soul food restaurant, and she comes up in the kitchen, and she's calling them, and you hear off stage bits and pieces of that scene where they're in a fight, and she hears what's happening, and she's just armed with okra, and she is gonna end it, and she's gonna end it now. And in welcoming her, both of her men, outside with food, she teaches them the lessons, and every time that we went through that, um, of, of the list of this food. It was not just about food, it's about the history of, of a community and the survival, so the set-asides are not set-aside, they're the sides that accompany you through life. And they bring you together to sit at the table to work your shit out. And so basically she gets them together and then it, it will, may not be clear this is the first time that we've actually done it anyway. I've never heard it. I only heard it at a brief rehearsal today and they're very brave to do that. They, they forgive each other and they begin to pray over this meal that the mother has not prepared because she's a modern mother. She's gotten takeout and they start to pray. As they start to pray, you won't see this, the congregation invades the space of the kitchen as the son starts telling them about his going to college and his recommendations, everybody leaves and you realize it's a memory that he, is, he ends this alone on stage because that is the last time that they saw him really alive was this final meal which he ends alone as the, um, the opera uh, goes to blackout. So let's welcome back our performers for the epilogue.
I gotta show you my new art piece. A collage. I know. Miss Wadley says she's going to get me into RISD. RISD! She's going to write me a bomb recommendation. Of course, you'll see me again. It's only four hours away. So good. No, Dad, I can't this weekend. One more, one more, a silent protest. Nothing will happen. You could come with me. Nothing will happen. Nothing, nothing, nothing will happen. So as you can see on that board, the world premiere is July 14th. Uh, <laughs> God, it's Bastille Day. Um, which leads me to the fact that we have other wonderful repertory this summer, including The Ghosts of Versailles by John Corleano. Yes, whoever's clapping, that's great. The, we're, we're featuring, we're kind of doing that arc. We're going Verdi, La Traviata, Corleano, Tesori. It's the sort of Italo <laughs> uh, stream through the season. Uh, and then we will be doing what we think of really as the first great American musical showboat uh, by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein. We also will be having a number of wonderful speakers Coates, as you have heard before, will be there on August 3rd. Um, Christine Ebersol is our artist in residence this summer. She will be in Showboat and she will be mentoring our young artists. Uh, we also will be doing a special kind of adaptation of Tchaikovsky's opera, The Queen of Spades, using Pushkin's poetry. It's uh, written by Kelly Rourke, our, drama, our uh, dramaturg. And this will be a sort of interesting theatrical experience which happens in the pavilion. We also have a youth opera this year. We've had uh, premieres up until now. This year we'll be doing Benjamin Britten's Noah's Flood. And there's a whole lot of other concerts, uh, speakers, uh, something like 80 events. So conveniently on your way out, you could grab a brochure if you've never been there. And if you have been there and you want to give one to a friend, we would appreciate it. All of us would love to welcome you there. There's members of our staff here tonight. And graciously, our hosts and producers this evening, Works and Process, here we are, are offering a lovely drink in the rotunda. So what a great idea to enjoy this incredible building, this icon of New York City, um, so close to where the opera takes place, like 20 blocks away. Uh, and Janine, Taz and the artists will all be there outside having a drink. So please, please join us, ask questions out there. Thank you for being a wonderful audience and for coming tonight. Thank you to all of our performers and to the creators. Thank you. Chris Powell.